just wonderful to have such a, a great group of people who can sing and play using their gifts to the Lord up front. I mean, like we've got a number of our, uh, you know, extended team out on camp. We also have a couple this weekend out at uh, Billawila assisting there, and uh, and we the team is just such a, a blessing to us all. And so we still have, uh, you know, just a quality team around us, top-notch uh, uh, musicians, singers, and gifted by the Lord, and we're grateful, so grateful for that, and we're the beneficiaries of, uh, of that blessing. Sorry, I'm just trying to get myself organised here. Too many, too many little bits. Let's pray once again. Father, we come, Lord, to uh, just honour you. We come, Lord, to open your word and to consider what it says. We come, Lord, to, uh, to just praise your name. We come, Lord, for your Holy Spirit now, no matter what I say, that your Spirit would have his way in each and every one of us. Lord, to bring us comfort or to disturb our comfortableness, to encourage us, to rebuke us, but definitely, Lord, to teach us. Lord, and as we uh, just discuss this topic uh, briefly today, Lord, we're in your hands and uh, we're just so grateful for that. It's the best, best, best place to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, we used this little line last week when we talked about uh, uh, forgiving others. Uh, next week we talk about forgiving yourself. And today we are talking about forgiving God. We'll get back to that interesting phrase. Um, but the, the line that we've used is, life is too short and God's calling on us is too big to live a life of unforgiveness, whether it's others, sort of God, or ourselves. Life is too short. God's call on our life of what he wants to do in and through us is far too big to live a life of unforgiveness. Um, I don't know how many of you avail yourself of the, um, the library here. Lots of good material in there. And, it, and if you've been a reader of any sort and you read Christian material, you get maybe inspired by like biographies or autobiographies where people share the incredible blessings and miracles that God has done in their life. You know, where they have uh, been saved from an incredible uh, storm, uh, maybe like Paul, but saved from an incredible storm where they've been shipwrecked or whatever it might be, saved from, uh, uh, from some sort of disease where God has miraculously restored some relationship, where there has been an incredible miracle of, of healing that's happened in their life. And you can get really encouraged and inspired by those stories or you can say, hmm, doesn't seem to happen to me. Or you can look around here and you can hear of stories from a number of folk here of, of just the miraculous healing in, in various forms uh, that people have had and you can be inspired and you can be encouraged. Or you can say, hmm, doesn't happen to me. And, and sometimes we're, we're a bit like that where we, we feel as though if, if God's at work, then he's at work in uh, maybe other people's lives, not so much doing the miracles in my life. And we can become a little bit disappointed in God. Are you allowed to say that? We can become a little bit, you know, disappointed that God hasn't answered our prayers of faith and uh, we feel maybe just a little bit let down that other people seem to get the good blessings and the miraculous blessings but our, our life doesn't seem to stack up 
with the blessings that they get and so we can feel just a little bit uh, uh, as though what God has not done as we would like him to and, and so we might feel as though okay well maybe that's not right maybe I need to forgive God let me just say technically but that's not right but God's never done anything wrong that requires forgiveness but it's certainly maybe how we perhaps feel from time to time um, but maybe we need to, to, to like, like get back in, in, in tune with God maybe you know learn to to trust him again because it just like seems to have been quiet or distant in our in our prayers and the answers to the prayers that we wanted and so we can feel as though that's uh, not going the way that we would hope to this story gives us a little bit of insight into this um, it did work yes it did work before the service uh, 1 Samuel 1 we know the story here we've got uh, these uh, three main players anyway there's Elkanah and Hannah and Penny um, when I was born this is the story the two stories that I know of about how I got my name one is that my eldest brother was upset that he didn't get a sister and so he got the right to choose the name the other story is, on the maternity building, there was a name, Ian MacDonald House. And so that's how I got my name from my parents. Obviously not creative at the time, better things to think about. Well, it's, oh, oh Ian, that comes to mind. Okay. Like, like what we do with names is, is not... Like we just pick a name that we like normally or that maybe... It, it, it's a family name, maybe it sort of means something, maybe. Uh, but certainly in, in uh, the, the days of we're looking at here, the Hebrew days, it's like the person is the name. I can still remember that phrase ringing out from my Bible college principle. The person is the name. Like there was something almost prophetic about the name like they didn't just choose like olive bill joy cliff whatever it might be you know they didn't just choose a random name or have the eldest brother call you in or something silly like that it's like the name the person is the name and so we see here um, the name Elkanah that's like destined to have a son or more literally perhaps God has created a son and God will give a son. Like that was his name, Elkanah. I mean, God will give a son. And then you see his wife, uh, Hannah, uh, which I know there's mums around here who could maybe you know, enlighten me a little bit more, but Hannah means like grace or favour. Is that right, Michelle? Yeah. Stop on, good, good. Is that coffee? Hmm? A pear. A pear. Okay. I was thinking if it, if it was cake, we could share. But anyway, okay. We could share a pear. Okay. Um, like, so if there was ever a couple that would have a son, it's like Hannah who was favoured and one who receives grace and Elkanah who, who is one who was promised a son, really. God will give him a son. And so we see how destined absolutely destined to have a child year after year year after year year after year zilch we see in the passage verse 2 Hannah had none And 
And it was like, it, it's a struggle enough in our culture at times where, where, where people do not have children. But so much more in that culture where there was a sense of, of the woman would provide a son and more, but a son. And to not do so would seem to be like you are, you are out of favour. Her name was Hannah, favour. You are out of favour with God. What did you do wrong? You were out of favour. And there was, like, if, if there was something in the name, here we have a great sense of shame that Hannah felt. Her identity would be wound up, at least in part, by the bearing of children, particularly the bearing of a son. We see that there was another wife, never goes well when there's more than one, but there's another wife, Penny. And verse 2 reminds us, Penny had kids, sons and daughters, and in all that time, zilch for Hannah. Zilch. But to make matters uh, even worse for poor, uh, for poor Hannah, we see, um, as, we, as we read on, um, you know, well, we can see Elkanah seemed to really love her and have some compassion upon her. Uh, we can read that in those couple of verse, verses there. But as we, as we move on, we see it was uh, not an easy time for Hannah. Year after year, they would venture off to Shiloh, which was in that point in time, which was before David, before the temple, etc., etc., before that place of worship, Shiloh was the place to go for worship. Shiloh would have been where the tabernacle was. Uh, Shiloh was the place to go. And so year after year, they would head off to Shiloh to, uh, to be involved in the sacrificial worship of Yahweh. Year after year, Penny would provoke and taunt Hannah. Like, look at my kids growing up. They're doing so well with Sabbath school, whatever. You know, look at my kids. Where You don't have any kids? What's the problem with you, Hannah? It was a cruel provoking by, uh, by Penny towards, uh, towards Hannah. And so we, uh, uh, we see that this happened year after year. Um, I use a saying at home occasionally when Cathy says something, mm. I, say, I would say, my mother warned me about girls like you. <laughs> or actually girls like this. And... And I, and I think, like, I think if my mother knew Penny, she would, she would say to me, I warned you about girls like that. Don't choose one like that. And so we see here that, uh, that Penny was taunting and provoking um, uh, um, Hannah. Uh, nasty girl, nasty girl. Hannah was, uh, was continuing to, to be praying and seeking the Lord about this and you might feel the same sometimes. Like for year after year after year after year, I've been praying for whatever, the salvation of my kids. I've been praying for the salvation of my parent. I've been praying for the, the job that I really need. I've been praying for the, uh, the, the struggles and the hardships of life that I have that God would intervene and, and bring about uh, uh, restoration and bring about comfort. I'd be praying about the struggle that I have with my physical health or the struggle I have with my mental health that God would perform a miracle there. I've been praying about um, you know, my relationships that are there that really seem to be in the doldrums and I've been praying so long and so hard and so often and yet God seems so silent. 
I think for many of us, we can feel a little of what Hannah felt. Where is God? Why doesn't God do something? Why doesn't God uh, bring about uh, you know, some uh, goodness in my life and, and answer these prayers, where are you, God? So much so for this Hannah, he, she was brought to tears and couldn't eat. She was in such, uh, in such distress. And you see, um, um, uh, Elkanah, he loved her and he was sensitive, but look, he was a man. How would this go, guys? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? I don't imagine that one went over very well. The other one's passable, I think. But that one, I don't think, no matter how much he loved her and how much she knew he loved I don't think that one would have helped, personally. I'm speaking from a little experience but not exactly the same, but a little experience. We see as we move on in the passage that Hannah did pray and she kept on praying. Once when she had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his, on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house and in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. This Hebrew word, weeping bitterly, it means something like this. It means bitter in her soul. Anguish. Bitter in her soul. And in weeping, she was weeping bitterly. She wasn't just upset, she was in agony, she was in anguish about what was happening and that she didn't have a son and, and that Penny was cruel as cruel as cruel. She was deep in her soul. There was bitterness. Bitterness, God, it's not answering my prayer. God could give me a son. But for year after year, I do not have a son. Maybe some of us have been there or are there in that way or in some other ways. Uh, but we see, uh, and then she cries out, Lord, remember me. Don't forget me. Don't forget me. And she's probably thinking, what have I done? What have I done wrong? Why can't I be blessed with the child like, like uh, Penny, like so many other ladies in the village, in the town, in the country, in the nation, in the world? Why can't I? Why am I not? My name is grace, favour. My husband's name is God will give a son and yet I'm barren and I do not have a son. And I wonder if we feel like that at times in our lives when, uh, you know, it's just so hard and the question is, why, why, why? What have I done? What have I not done? Why? Uh, certainly, Hannah wasn't alone. If you read a passage like uh, Jeremiah uh, chapter 20, you see like anguish and pain and like, where is God and what have I done? to deserve this. We read David in some of the Psalms, a similar sort of anguish about, Lord, why do you continue to let my enemies taunt me? Why? It's always a big question. Always a big question. And it's sometimes like when we need God most, sometimes it seems like he is quiet. And sometimes it seems like he's turned our back on us. But I think God would rather have us do a Hannah than, than just turn our back on him. 
God would rather us come to him and pour out the, the bitter anguish in our soul than say, forget you, God, I'm out of here. God's big enough to handle all of those things. And then we see, and then we see it uh, move on where, uh, you know, Eli sees her and says, you drunk girl? He said, no, 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 I'm just crying out to God just quietly. And, and then she, she bargains with God, as some people might put it, where she says, give me a son. I will do anything. I will give him to you. And in a sense, literally, I will bring him back to this place of worship and he will uh, stay here once he's weaned. I will give him to you. And uh, Eli says, may God grant you your request. Um, how come this thing always works before the service? Wouldn't it? Have you got the magic touch? You do. No, back one. Back the other way. Other way. That, that'll do. No, no, no. One before? Okay, that'll do. Yep, that'll do. Anyway, we could have read 12 and to 19, but you, you read the story yourself. What does she do? What does she do? She hangs on even when heaven's so quiet. She hangs on even when there is uh, no open door, no blessing that she should receive and she continues to believe and trust in God. It's like, as, as someone says, not seeing anything does not mean that God's not doing anything. Like she waited and she waited. But immediately, what do we see we do? Early the next morning... They arose and worshipped before the Lord and then went back to their home. She hangs on and she turns up. She cries out to God and complains, where are you, where are you, where are you? She hangs on but she also turns up and she continues to trust and put her faith in God. And as I said there, a waiting, can't spell it, a waiting season is never a wasted season. No, nope. a waiting season is never a wasted season. And God's delays are not necessarily God's denies. Just because you're waiting doesn't mean you're in limbo land. Doesn't mean like nothing else should happen. What it means is, is that you hang on to him and turn up. You continue to put your trust in him you continue to honor him when god seems as though he's not responsive doesn't mean he's not doing anything but when god seems he's not responsive it doesn't mean you'd be non-responsive to him literally it means you hang on it means you turn up and in this case uh, we see something amazing. But there's other people, of course, in the scriptures who are hanging on and turning up. Other people in your life, you probably have seen hang on and turn up. And maybe you have a wonderful testimony yourself of hanging on and turning up. Certainly way back in the Old Testament, you have people like uh, Habakkuk. It was like, cry out to God, these people around me are just pathetic. This nation is sinful and turned back on you. Do something. God says, okay, I'll, 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 the Babylons or Babylonians will come in and, and wipe it out and take them off into exile. So, oh, not sure I like that idea, God. Don't know about that idea. It's not what I had in mind as an answer to prayer. But then, to cut a long story short, if you know the ending of the book, and many people of my age are a little bit younger or older, We'll know that great chorus of yesteryear, which is in Habakkuk. Though the fig tree does not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vine, etc., etc., yet, big word, yet will I rejoice in the Lord. Though, though God doesn't seem to answer, though God seems so quiet or 
the answer to what I cry out for just seems totally opposite to what I want, yet will I hang on and turn up? Yet will I? Uh, I read some people like to analyse things like faith and, the, and they use a couple of levels of faith. There's the level of faith where, you know, things go your way type faith, you know, everything's smooth and cushy and comfortable and, and so we walk in faith. And then there's another level of faith when things don't go well at all. But you still hang on and you still turn up. And then there's another level of faith where everything seems to go the opposite of what you would believe should happen. Where maybe you're in Ukraine and you cry out, uh, you cry out for God to do something and, and the Russians come. I'm not saying the Russians are an answer to God to their prayers, that's for sure. But, you know, we're, we're totally, you cry out to God for, for peace in your land and prosperity in your land, and then you get invaded. Like level three faith where, where you, the opposite seems to be happening. And, and, and so where is God in the midst of this chaos, which seems to point totally the opposite to what you would think God might, might allow or do? Job. Likewise. Most of family, all the wealth, health, gone. Where's God? Where's God? And his friends cry out, where's God? And what have you done wrong? Blah, blah, blah. But he hangs on. And he turns up. What about our faithfulness? Like we, you know, we might say, oh, I'm, I just, I am just so, in, in not a proud way, I'm just so faithful. Like I do what I know God wants me to do. I seek to live his way. I do all the right things. And yet, God, I get cancer. My neighbours, like, I can hear their blasphemy from inside my house. And they just reject you and anything that's got anything to do with you. And yet, they're healthy and wealthy. Where are you, God? Do you hang on and do you turn up? Doesn't seem fair. What do we do? We hang on and we turn up. Now, if we can go to that next one, thank you, Lynette, that's good. We see in this case, may not be my case, may not be your case, in this case, in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And she named him, again, the person, uh, the, name, the person is the name, Samuel, which means something like, because I asked the Lord for him. What other name could she give? You may or may not recognise at least one of the ladies in that photo. Uh, the younger lady... She's the one who actually gave birth to the child, not the older lady. The younger lady is Jenny Morrison, our ex-Prime Minister's wife. You may know that they struggled. And for 14 years, they sought to have children and could not. Uh, they undertook uh, IVF and uh, major surgery. And, of course, eventually they did have uh, two beautiful little girls. And this lady was, uh, the older lady there was just after the first daughter was born, as I understand it, this older lady uh, passed away. She was Auntie Margaret. And Auntie Margaret had been the faithful, hang on and turn up type lady. And she continued to pray and to pray and to pray uh, for a baby for, uh, for the Morrison family. 
think she died soon after that first one was born. But just a couple of quotes from Jenny. Like, when she got news once again of IVF failing, she said, God can see it all, and I can't. So I just have to trust. She hung on. She turned up. The waiting season was not a wasted season. She says, There were very hard times. They also provided me with great strength. The waiting season for Jenny Morrison was not a wasted season. And so whether or not God answers the prayer in the way you expect or in the desire that you have, we need to hang on and we need to turn up. And we need to ensure that we walk with him every moment of the day because he is faithful, he is beautiful, and he loves you so dearly. And you may not see the answer to your prayer in the way that you want. But what you do see is the cross of Calvary. What you do see is, is the expression of his greatest possible love for you. And it gives me reason to hang on and turn up knowing that his love is just infinite, knowing his love extend, extended so much to Calvary, knowing that even though I was an enemy of his, he died for my sin, even though he was an enemy of each, and, uh, you, you, where each and every one of us are enemies of his or we're enemies of his, he died for our sin. We need to hang on. And turn up. Because if he would come and do that for you, as the Bible uses the phrase so often, how much more will he do for us in our lives? How much more does he love and care for us? Maybe we don't get the answer that we want. Maybe we get the answer we don't want. But we know his sovereignty and we know his compassion and we know his wisdom and we know his grace so we can hang on and turn up. So don't let the waiting time be wasted time. Let's pray. Father, we know that life is too short and your call on us is too big uh, to live a life with unforgiveness. Father, we've all probably been through struggles and pain where we just wish you'd do something and do it now. And Lord, some can testify how miraculously you've done that now but some can also testify that you haven't and Lord we know that doesn't mean it relates to uh, a favour or out of favour but Lord I thank you that in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the struggle, in the midst of someone like Hannah in her bitter anguish we can cry out to you and you hear us and you hug us. Lord, help us to, to, to recognize that as we wait, it shouldn't be a wasted time because we continue to need to hang on and turn up. Father, and may, uh, may dear folk here today who have been hanging on and turning up, 
even in the midst of the uh, prayer that's been at the at the core of their heart perhaps lord where they long for that miraculous healing where they long for maybe that uh, that child where they long for that relationship where they long for whatever it is lord may i dare to pray as you i said may god grant you your request i ask it in his name Amen.